Welcome back to the online catechism. Tonight we uh, we go through our third session, which is on the person and work of Christ. As I was saying in the pre-recorded intro, this is one of the most exciting of topics, especially from my point of view. It's an area uh, that I've done a great deal of work on, but it's also one that I think can uh, represent a great deal of inspiration to the Christian who is seeking to grow in uh, their own sense of faith, not least because um, it will, I think, throw into relief the kinds of assumptions we often make about the person and work of Christ, who we perceive him to be, and what he actually might mean to us when considered in the fullness of Orthodox tradition. So with that, I'm going to uh, open up, I'm going to share my screen and open up a presentation. And here we have our title for the evening. Not much more to say about that. But what I want to begin by expressing to you is the fact that each and every one of us has a Christology. Now, what does that mean? It means that each and every one of us lives with certain assumptions about the person of Christ equally what it is that Christ does for us. Now, you might not think of yourself as a theologian, but in this respect, you are, in the sense that you will make assumptions that could be based on experiences you had as a child, or on the basis of a helpful image that came to mind when you were at a low point in your life. I could go on by way of examples, but it doesn't really matter. The fact is, when you think of Christ, you will default to a particular image. So let's take a look at some of these possible images. Here in the top left corner, we see a rather sentimental um, picture of the nativity. We see the baby Jesus lying in the manger, followed by uh, a Latin American cross associated with a certain kind of theology. Some people might look and see a simple, colorful, and um, ethnically expressive cross from Latin America. But in fact, it is uh, something that uh, as much represents liberation, the idea of Christ as liberator, as anything else. And uh, hence the the multicolors being, um, you know, being so well represented on on the wood background. Some people, uh, when they are thinking about uh, Jesus Christ, uh, will have minds that go towards what we possibly dismissively call the laughing Jesus. I want you to um, be aware, though, that however either inappropriate or unhelpful uh, or equally helpful, you find the various pictures I'm showing you now. I'm not showing you anything that's wrong. There's nothing wrong in, um, in, in the uh, images, but rather um, something um, uh, that is not multifaceted. In other words, something that is not expressive of the fullness that we're after as, as Orthodox Christians. This is a famous painting and one that um, I have had the privilege to see myself hanging um, in the chapel at Keble College in Oxford. Uh, this is um, one that many of you uh, will already know. Certainly it's one that uh, served as the background to a, a card-based wall hanging I had in my own room growing up. Here, Mel Gibson's famous film, one that I personally cannot bear watching for a whole number of reasons, but it may have been something that you'd seen and felt helpful. A conventional Latin crucifix. This is something that adorns the walls of uh, the classroom of every uh, or every classroom of every Catholic school, I suspect, and one that is most commonly associated with the the Latin faith, with the Roman Catholic uh, tradition. Finally, you get an icon. In this case, it's a, a picture of a mosaic icon of 
Christ. And this uh, represents, as you will all know uh, already, the uh, traditional Orthodox representation of the Pantocrator, that is the ruler of all things. So when I began by saying everyone as a, has a Christology, you might reflect on any of these images and think, oh yes, that one, whichever one, has been one that uh, my mind has gone to in the past uh, for a whole number of reasons or continues to go to now as I seek to make prayers. Um, and I want to say from the beginning that uh, that is not necessarily wrong. But what we want to do is to draw it more fully and deeply into the multifaceted picture that is Christ as understood within Orthodox tradition. But to, um, to reinforce my point that everyone has a Christology, um, I would point to the uh, examples around us. In culture, we're surrounded by portrayals of Christ, of what we might call a folk understanding of the word made flesh. Now, I put that disclaimer there somewhat lightheartedly, but I'm going to be drawing on examples from across culture here, and I don't uh, expect all of you to appreciate every one that I mention. But take a look in the first uh, case to musical examples. Anybody who has uh, attended liturgy with me will know that when I preach, I will draw on uh, the words of Leonard Cohen very frequently. But here I've got Johnny Cash as well, Lou Reed, U2, Bob Dylan. The list could go on. Nothing I'm showing you now is exhaustive. But who would have guessed necessarily that in some of the best known recording artists, you would find lyrics replete with implicit and sometimes even explicit references to Jesus Christ. In film, the work of the director Terence Malick has been um, particularly uh, open about its uh, about uh, the exploration of spirituality in general, but uh, with a fairly clearly um, Christian perspective behind it. The work, again, of Paul Thomas Anderson, I have no idea what his uh, faith is or if he indeed has any formal adherence to, to a faith, but I do know that Magnolia in particular and much of his work reflects a deep sense of spiritual truth. Wim Wenders uh, was actually awarded uh, many decades ago by Pope John Paul II, uh, for his contributions to uh, to the art of cinema. So he comes from some uh, sense of, of faith perspective who would watch E.T. and think automatically of the life of Christ. And yet um, the story really contains all of the elements you find in the gospel in terms of E.T. being something of a uh, a rejuvenator of the home life of the main character, and then uh, uh, continuing uh, into a moment of suffering, at which point he dies, after which he is revived, and then is uh, uh, born uh, by Elliot on his bike to the place where the spaceship awaits to uh, return him to his home. I'm sure by phrasing the narrative that way, you will have already twigged to the fact that we're talking about um, a metaphor in many ways for the gospel. And finally, even something like Toy Story. I won't say much about that now, but uh, um, I think that uh, a conversation I had with a dear friend of mine many years ago was very instructive in pointing out how even the work of Disney Pixar as um, superficially uh, post-religious as it is, uh, can well be seen as um, somewhat instructive in the uh, spiritual life, and even specifically at times, the Christian life. So that's where Christology is. It's in us, it's all around us. But we have to uh, now explore, first of all, what the word itself means, but also where it emerges from. 
Christology is, as you've already guessed, the study of the person of Jesus Christ. Coupled with that is an, a linked word called soteriology, which is the study of the work of Christ. Uh, ology, the suffix, one that you'll all be familiar with, simply comes from uh, the Greek word logos. And uh, in this case, the prefix Christo uh, is, is uh, from the name Christ. Um, therefore, it's a word about Christ. Soteriology, um, a word about soter is savior, a word about the saving work of Christ. And uh, I will go back and forth uh, when I'm uh, talking about one topic or the other, but assume them both under the form of Christology. I'm going to pause there for a moment and uh, just take up a question that has appeared. It reads, Roman Catholics like to meditate on the suffering endured by Christ on the way to Cal Calvary and in his passion. Do the Orthodox do anything similar? Because I've prayed the Akathist to our sweetest Lord Jesus Christ, and it didn't seem too dissimilar to Roman Catholic devotions of the individual inserting himself in the life of Christ. In summary, Roman Catholics generally see the crucifixion as a tragedy followed by victory in the resurrection. However, the Orthodox, according to Ware, that is uh, Metropolitan Callistus Ware, venerate also um, the crucifixion as victory. Am I wrong? Nonetheless, another book I've read by an Orthodox priest, Schmemann's For the Life of the World, writes of the crucifixion of having been a terrible tragedy, depriving humans of a paradise as God intended the world to be. Thoughts? Well, um, I, if you don't mind, I want you to uh, re-flag that question uh, toward the end of the presentation, simply because I think that what you're going to find is that um, we answer um, really the series of questions across our discussion. Um, if we do not, uh, I implore you to raise it again so that we don't miss anything. Nonetheless, it's at least down in writing so we can take it up and, uh, and uh, be assured that it will be answered. So we've come to understand what the word Christology means in a general sense. Where does it emerge from? Well, to begin with, it isn't inherently obvious that there is just a single Christology that the church has always understood and taught. Now, I pause there only because I want to cause a bit of scandal. But now that I have, at least rhetorically, I'm going to um, draw back from that statement and say, the church has taught the same Christ from the beginning. But the fullness of expression for who that Christ was and what he did took a number of centuries to fully articulate. And I've imposed, as I'm saying this, uh, our topic over a map of the Mediterranean world. And um, you'll see why I've done so in, in the next few moments. But the story of how the church comes to articulate its understanding of the person and work of Christ has a lot to do with geography. Here I call it um, Christological cultures. And I would say that there were really three. Now, please understand everything I'm about to say over the next number of minutes uh, should not be um, taken in absolute terms. There is such thing and always will be such thing as, as nuance. And by talking about three Christological cultures, I'm not saying that there were hard and fast borders drawn between any of them or that they didn't extend even beyond uh, the regions that we might suppose. But let's use them as home bases, you might say, in order to communicate be better some of the concepts attached to the development of our understanding of Christ. So here you see three great cities of the Mediterranean world, Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch. 
here I'm splitting them. So you can already see a split I've drawn between east and west. It's not a clearly, it's not a straight line, but it uh, will help us navigate the world of regional Christological understanding. But there's another line to come, and that goes there. The first instance, to the left of the line, we uh, would refer to a Western or a Latin or a Roman Christological culture. To the right of the line, to the east of the line, we might think of an Antiochian culture or Antiochian, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And finally, the wedge at the bottom we're describing as Alexandrian. Now, why um, do I use such terms and how would I describe these cultures? Very loosely, we'll start with Antioch. There is a relationship between exegetical tradition, that is, the tradition of how the Antiochians read the Bible, and their understanding of the work of Christ. I think it was Meyendorf who talked of um, anthropological maximalism. You won't be tested on that word, but if you've got a head for it, by all means, try to remind it, uh, to, to remember it. Anthropological maximalism. That means that in the Antiochian part of the world, there was a tendency to emphasize the humanity of Christ. Why would they do this? And how would that link to their approach to reading the scriptures? Well, at exactly the same time as they took an interest in the humanity of Christ, they also took an interest in reading the text in a more literal, historical way. That doesn't mean they read the text in the way that a 19th or 20th century or a 21st century fundamentalist would read the biblical text. It just means that they were interested in the nitty gritty, meaning when they read about the events of Jesus's life, they wanted to cast those events in a real history. They wanted to understand what they meant in uh, their context in time, in their human context. And you can see how that might move across into um, seeing the incarnate Lord that way as well. So you might say that the Antiochian approach to Christology was a ground up type of approach. They were starting in the dust beneath their feet and working their way up through the person to God. Sometimes that Antiochian tendency led to extremes, and we're going to look at uh, those extremes in a few moments, but uh, let's just uh, leave it there uh, for now and ascribe to the Antiochian world a sort of ground-up approach to understanding the person of Christ. And so we move um, in a clockwise fashion to Alexandria. And we come to Alexandria and encounter the exact opposite approach to that which we found in Antioch. The Alexandrian um, uh, approach, both to scriptural exegesis, in other words, to their um, reading of the Bible, as well as to uh, their interpretation, their understanding of the person of Christ was more top down. The Alexandrians, when it came to reading, were very, were very philosophical. They were quite happy to read um, the books of the Bible, the various sacred texts, as having a metaphorical import. In other words, not seeing uh, what we encounter there in literal terms, but rather looking for their meaning in spiritual terms and in terms that could uh, that we might relate to from a philosophical perspective. So consider this. We have four Gospels. We talked about this last week. We have four Gospels, 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, those first three Gospels are often referred to in scholarship as the synoptic Gospels. That means they're three Gospels that share a particular, well, they share actually a series of texts between them, but they also share a perspective. They're more conventional in their storytelling approach. In that respect, I don't mean anything inappropriate by this, but if we look at the nativity story by way of example, we encounter in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and of course, especially in Luke, who is the primary storyteller around the uh, nativity, something like, once upon a time, there was a young woman who uh, um, was in her home when she was visited by an angel. The angel told her that she would give birth to a son, and so she did. Now, compare that to the Gospel of John. Same story. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's incredible. Both are reflecting on the idea that the Word of God has taken on flesh. One tells it to us, of course, there is, you know, they, they, this story is replete with theological significance, but tells it to us in terms that we can more easily approach. John, meanwhile, um, on the wings of, of angels, tells us that in the beginning was the word. He starts up in the heavens and then brings us down to earth with the Logos, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. What I'm suggesting in telling you all of this is that the first three Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, kind of reflect an Antiochian approach to things. They weren't written in Antioch. All I'm saying is that they are kind of, they serve as a kind of example of the way the Antiochian culture might approach the story of the incarnate word of Jesus Christ. John's gospel, by contrast, reflects more of an Alexandrian cultural approach, more philosophical, starting up in the heavens and coming down to earth. You might, you might think that um, by talking at such length about Antioch and Alexandria, I'd exhausted the picture, but no. We come to Rome, and Rome's take is very much linked to Rome's cultural disposition as a whole. Rome was the seat of empire, and as such, it had to be very good at administration. Administration of what? But justice. What made any empire work? but peace and justice. And Rome brought both of these things with her as she spread around the Mediterranean world. So when they are thinking about Christ in Rome or in a Roman context, they might be starting from an administrative point of view, a point of view that accounts for justice. So Rome says, why does God become man? How do we account for um, the story of this person, Jesus Christ? Well, we account for it because um, we break the law and the law must be satisfied. So in that, you don't get the same philosophical reflection that you get in Alexandria. You don't get the same concern with the gritty um, sort of dust under the feet of the incarnate Logos. You don't get the sort of ground up approach of Antioch. Rather, you get a juridical approach, an approach that is first concerned with a why that leads to uh, satisfaction. So the word made flesh Jesus Christ is seen as cohering with their sense of, you might say, good order, the rightness of the law.
and peace. So I've outlined that here rather than in, in, in a graphical form by way of a map, rather as a table. Rome, Christology that arises from administrative legal instinct and focuses on, I said, satisfaction. Here I've said atonement. Antioch arises from earthy, empirical, here and now instinct. It focuses on humanity, the humanity of Jesus and morality. In other words, what does Jesus do? Finally, Alexandria, it arises from philosophical first principles instinct, and it focuses on divinity and the implications of divinity um, uh, having become uh, man. Having spoken of three Christological cultures, though, you might wonder, well, how do we arrive at um, uh, sort of a modern picture that talks in terms of East and West? Well, I would encourage you to avoid absolutes in this regard, going back to my original statement um, uh, on, on that matter. But um, broadly speaking, it is fair to say that in the East, the perspective of Antioch and Alexandria over the course of eight centuries of debate synthesized so that you get on one side of the line a Christological synthesis that draws on the insights of both the more philosophical school and the more human-oriented school while on the uh, Latin side, the Western side, you get development based on that initial juridical uh, administrative sort of instinct. Before I move on from this map, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that within um, both halves of the Christian world at this stage, you find centers um, that have uh, multiplied, that that have um, carried on uh, the traditions respective to their closest regions. And, and I say that particularly with my eye on Edessa. Now I'm going to draw the cursor over there. Hopefully you can see this. But Edessa, in not quite the middle of Turkey, is um, is of great importance within the Syriac Christian tradition. Now, the Syriac tradition has close affinity with or to the Antiochian tradition, the Antiochian tradition. Um, the Edessenes or the, uh, or the Syrians are um, uh, take a perspective on Christ originally that uh, is not dissimilar to that which you would have found in Antioch. But ultimately, the Syriac tradition, most famously represented by the great Saint Ephraim, uh, kind of um, uh, cuts its own furrow. It goes its own way, not so much away from the Orthodox Christian faith as it is received by the overwhelming number of Orthodox in the world, at least not in the beginning, but rather by way of how they express it. Syrian or Syriac Christianity takes a rather poetic approach to um, to the Christological questions. And if you want to know what um, what sort of Christology they hold, what kind of um, understanding of Christ develops in the uh, Syriac tradition, your first stop would best be the poetry of Saint Ephraim and the prayers that he composed. Um, for although they're by no means systematic, in other words, they don't go through um, the person and work of Christ according to any kind of um, uh, regulated system, uh, they are replete with, uh, with a vocabulary and a wonder around the word made flesh. So very beautiful. And of course, it becomes part of the Byzantine synthesis or the, the Eastern synthesis uh, that we call our own today. You'll find uh, the prayer of St. Ephraim as uh, part of our liturgy, especially in Lent. This is uh, 
the same table as I put up before, this time, however, just showing you that on the right side of the line, you get that, um, that which I called the Byzantine synthesis, the coming together of the Antiochian and Alexandrian traditions into sort of a, a, a singular view of Christ, which um, certainly um, goes uh, back and forth over the first eight centuries of the history of the church in terms of its emphasis, sometimes falling into one heresy or another, which we'll look at momentarily, but which uh, settles as, um, as something that we would recognize today. I didn't realize that the spacing had been uh, messed up when I was transferring this presentation, and hence uh, the icon uh, on the right-hand side of the resurrection overlaps the, the wording. But instead of listing them as Roman, Antiochian, and Alexandrian, here we can simplify it and say Latin stroke Western, um, none of which actually changes in terms of how it's described, but Greek stroke Eastern which uh, does change because it draws together the insights of Antioch and Alexandria. It spends time hammering out an acceptable formula for how we understand Christ, and it focuses on the resurrection and its implications. And that sort of goes uh, one step towards answering the question that was asked, and uh, which I read out uh, a number of moments ago. So what do we mean? So going back to this slide, what do we mean by, in order to arrive at the Greek or uh, Eastern synthesis, um, they had to spend time hammering out an acceptable formula? Well, that's what takes us to this slide. What I'm about to say is, once again, something that is worth all of you holding in mind, lest you think that somehow... Um, our full understanding of the person and work of Christ was simply um, extracted from a box, uh, fully articulated. What we're going to look at is the councils, the ecumenical councils, the councils that were held by and accepted by the whole church that enabled us to um, come to the understanding of Christ that we have today. So we're going to explore that, but I'm going to go back up because I see that another question has come in, and uh, it is a request to uh, summarize um, what's gone on so far. If we get a chance at the end, uh, I will be happy to just uh, review, but otherwise, because this is being recorded, I would say that you'll have a chance to uh, obviously catch up for anything that you might have missed. That said, if anybody can both think uh, process and type all at the same time, they can feel free to try to uh, send you a typed summary in the comments box. So imagine this. Jesus ascends into heaven, having left his disciples with what I sometimes call last-minute instructions. In other words, having equipped the disciples to become apostles, uh, you know, uh, with the, with the, um, a blessing of the Holy Spirit. Um, and yet, even then, they have to contend with the fact that in his life, Jesus was referred to as Son of God, as Son of Man. He asked and was asked if he was the Messiah, the King of the Jews. Now, those are just a few titles attributed to him or somehow attached to him in his life. How are we supposed to mash those together or account for them, allowing them their full integrity? Take, for example, the first two titles I mentioned, Son of God, Son of Man. They sound, at first hearing, as if they um, are contradictory. And yet, the Gospels are unabashed in deploying those titles. What are we to make of that? Well, those types of questions were not lost on the Apostles, and they were not lost on the successors of the Apostles. So, as late then, as 
the late third century, early fourth century. So say from 290 to 310, it actually goes beyond 310. You have an argument that emerges in Alexandria. There is a well-known and respected priest named Arius. The patriarch at the time is Patriarch Alexander. And um, Arius is it becomes known for preaching that Christ, however great he was, however much they preached his mission, could be considered only as a subordinate to God whom we call Father. So in other words, Christ in the mind of Arius, even if he was created the greatest of all creatures, well above the angels, even if he had godlike qualities, could not be God, not in the way that God the Father was God. Now that sounds non-Christian. And of course, we understand today that it is. But Arius was not um, seeking to be destructive. He wanted to preserve the integrity of God. God was one. How could we possibly deign to suggest that Jesus Christ was God, because you can't compute an almighty singular God with the idea that he should, A, have a son, that he should um, be nailed to a cross, that he should undergo human experience, because God, um, as conceived philosophically, is impassable. He can't have such experiences as we would um as we would know through our um, our passions and our interpretive experience. Well, there was a feisty deacon by the name of Athanasius who got wind of what Arius was preaching and um, emerged like a boxer into the middle of the ring, ready to take up the cause of a proper, what becomes the orthodox understanding of Christ. He says, absolutely not, Arius. Christ is and must be conceived of as being of the same substance as the Father. In other words, Christ was and had to be God. Because if he wasn't, then all the stuff he did couldn't really have been permanently and absolutely done. Well, and the argument that erupted first in Alexandria spreads. And if you believe the great church historian Eusebius, it spreads so widely around the Mediterranean world that people are even arguing about it in the streets. And the, um, the result of the argument is that the emperor Constantine, who by 313 has first legalized and then um, made Christianity the official religion of the empire, is concerned that it's going to do damage to the unity of the empire. So this can't, um, you know, he can't abide this. So he calls the bishops together and um, puts them together in council in a city called Nicaea, modern-day Turkey, in the year 325. At the Council of Nicaea, the church, represented by bishops from all its corners, argue and hammer out what, be, um, what becomes for us the Nicene Creed, the Creed of Nicaea. And in it is a wonderful phrase where we declare Christ to be of one substance with the Father of one substance, homo usios. And there are many sort of details to that story that could take up uh, a session in and of itself. 
which can get me very excited. But I'm going to leave it there and you can um, look at the summary of the council's decisions on the right-hand column. But um, know that uh, in the, uh, at the end of the first council, the church was very clear that um, Jesus Christ, the uh, man that had been experienced by the disciples and preached by the apostles, was in fact fully God. This, just because a council settles it, doesn't settle it absolutely. There are still, still people hanging on to the Arian idea. Um, but then, of course, if you hammer out the relationship between um, uh, the Word of God, the Word made flesh, and God the Father, what are we to make of this third person also mentioned in the Gospels, the Holy Spirit? And um, so it is this that comes to um, be discussed at the second ecumenical council, which is held at Constantinople in 381. It is at the Council of Constantinople that the creed first begun at the Council of Nicaea is completed. And its completion comes about with the third paragraph on the Holy Spirit. And in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. So, the full name of the creed is the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed, and it is actually composed over the course of both councils um, and uh, was finalized, completed in the uh, late 4th century. Before I continue, I want to draw your attention to the uh, dark or the, the beige column with the seesaw image in the middle with D and H. Uh, what I've done there is to suggest is to give you a visual simplification of the councils. I'm not going to go through all seven councils with you. I've only told you about the first two because of their importance. We're going to race through three and four. But suffice it to say that if you want to know what the first seven councils or the seven ecumenical councils of the church are about, they're about where the emphasis for Christ uh, will fall. In other words, will they emphasize divinity? In which case the seesaw is pointing up towards the D. Or will they rebalance and emphasize the humanity? In which case the seesaw is pointing up toward the H. So that's the, the logic of that uh, uh, visual column I've added there. And you'll see why it can be a helpful guide when we talk about the Council of Ephesus. Fifty years pass after the First Council of Constantinople. And by this time, another problem has arisen. Nestorius, an Antiochian bishop, refuses to use the uh, term Theotokos, mother or bearer of God. He says that he is willing to uh, call Mary the mother of the Lord, but he is not comfortable referring to her as the Theotokos, the God bearer, the mother of God. But of course, you can see how that starts to overemphasize his humanity to the point where it undermines what we understand of Christ's divinity. We've already determined that he is one substance with the Father. He is God. And if he's God, he has to be God right from the beginning. There's no point at which he becomes God later, even if it's still in the womb. He's God from his conception. Therefore, we have to say that Mary is the God-bearer, the Theotokos, because if we don't, we fail to recognize that God was God, it was God the Word made flesh, was God the Word made flesh from the moment his flesh was announced by the angel Gabriel. So the Council of Ephesus, Ephesus um, was about emphasizing Christ's divinity. And 
now. The Council of Chalcedon or Chalcedon, you'll hear it pronounced both ways, takes place in 451. This is an important council, as they all are, but especially because it is from the Council of Chalcedon that we get what is called the Chalcedonian definition for Christ. It's the definition for Christ that is supposed to be able to end all further discussion. After the Council of Ephesus, after Nestorius was beaten, the pendulum swung the other way. And there were those in Alexandria who thought, oh, good, now we can really um, call Christ what he is, which is fully God. And um, by doing so, they under um, emphasized to, to the point of diminishing his humanity, talking of Christ as if his humanity was just like a costume, but that he was in fact fully and actually God. But if we understand it that way, we fall into another problem. If he was only pretending to take on our humanity and wasn't fully human, well, then uh, what did he actually do for us? He just put in a show like, um, like an extra in the theater or something like that. Um, and so the Council of Chalcedon is called and um, results in the Chalcedonian definition, which is very simply that Christ was fully God and fully man. Fully God, fully man. After that, and I don't mean to demean or diminish the importance of the remaining three councils, but essentially all further Christological disputes were about um, trying to work out how the Chalcedonian definition could be worked out and understood in the life of the church. Concluding with the uh, second council of Nicaea, the last of the ecumenical councils held in 787, uh, at which uh, iconoclasm, that is the rejection of icons, were condemned, uh, or sorry, was condemned, thereby um, upholding icons as a sign of Christological orthodoxy. In other words, because we understand that Christ is fully God and fully man, and that because of the incarnation, matter, that is the stuff of which our bodies are made, is sanctified, it means that matter can now be used to depict holy things. In other words, the Seventh Ecumenical Council was about working out the implications of the Christological definition of Chalcedon. I'm going to pause there for a moment and just take a breath. Take a breath because, A, I need it, but I realize I've just thrown a lot of information at you. And while this will be broadcast again later, if any of you have a mobile phone and want to take a photograph of this chart, um, I would strongly uh, advise it. Or if you've been able to scribble out, uh, scribble it out in note form, I, I hope that uh, uh, that will prove helpful to you. But um, the point is that uh, in sort of a single sheet, it's possible to at least remember how and why the councils uh, were important and how they helped us work out, especially in the Christian East, a fuller and more um, uh, uh, a fuller and more synthesized, synthesized understanding of Christ. So, returning to our seesaw, Orthodox Christology looks like this. In other words, it is balanced between an understanding that. Um, the incarnate Lord is fully and truly divine, fully and truly human. Emerging then from the East, the councils of which we've just spoken were universal councils. In other words, they are um, at least uh, ostensibly accepted by the whole church, East and West. In the West, um, 
they continue to uh, sort of, you know, live um, within the Orthodox framework, but it's actually by around the time of the seventh ecumenical council that um, the, the, the different paths that the uh, the different path that the Western Church will take is becoming um, more manifest. But assuming the orthodoxy of both sides of the border, so-called East and West, I've presented you with this wonderful picture that represents the universal tradition before it um, it splits one from the other. And so you've got um, pictures uh, right and left that are roughly equivalent. That is simple uh, line drawings of a bishop, priest, and deacon, liturgical representatives of Christ, a bishop, priest, and deacon in the Latin West, liturgical representations of Christ. But within the uh, um, uh, within the conversation of understanding how Christ is understood and manifest in the world, um, one of the um, one of the features of the conversation is how the emperor and the patriarch, or how the king and the bishop, relate to one another. So I deliberately threw these two images in. One from the West, the coronation by Pope Leo III of the Emperor Charlemagne in 800. And here the Emperor uh, uh, Michael I by Patriarch Nikephoros in 811, so roughly uh, contemporaneous. But um, the, the, the Christian world uh, sought to work out the balance between, of, uh, between temporal power and and um, church power as an icon, you might say, of Christ, one representing Christ's humanity, the other his divinity. And I think quite interestingly, you saw those exact scenes replicated at the coronation of um, King Charles uh, just this past summer. Now, I haven't put this final image up uh, before we move on uh, to the actual theology of Christ to uh, be contentious. It is to say that the picture previous, had the church not gone its separate ways, uh, or had the, the West not um, chosen the path that it went down, um, the church might look something like that, notwithstanding the the faults, foibles, and, and differences between the, the, the actual um, living or uh, recently living men that we see, but um, just uh, using them as symbols. In the shortest period of time possible, I've given you a sense of the history of Christ or how the church has come to understand and articulate uh, who he is and something of what he does. Alas, because um, we've already been at it for uh, almost an hour, we're going to, I am actually thinking that I'm going to take this off share for right now. I want to look at the implications of Christ, obviously. That's intrinsic to our discussion. But um, because I've spent so much time on the history, and while some of that, some of you may not find interesting, others may find it interesting, I want to open it up for conversation now. If we go somewhere with that conversation, then we will limit today's session to the first half of what I had planned as my presentation and actually add a session to our catechism by doing a, a part two on Christology, where we look at the implications of, of our understanding of the person and work of Christ. So let me uh, open it up, ask you if there are any questions or comments that you would like to make. And uh, perhaps that would give me a chance to begin with um, the question that came in early. Roman Catholics like to meditate on the suffering endured by Christ on the way to Calvary and, his, and in his passion. Okay. To that statement, I say, Yes, that is true. 
to the point where, if you remember um, one of the earliest slides I put up, um, I showed you that traditional Latin crucifix, and I said then that you would find that in the classroom of every uh, or every classroom of every Catholic school in the world almost, and certainly find it in churches. But what does it depict? It depicts the suffering Christ. That reflects necessarily the um, the reality of of sort of a, a Latin emphasis. Okay, is it wrong? No, but is it just a part of a whole? Yes. I do find, and this is an observation that I'm happy to be challenged on by uh, any Catholic theologians or uh, Western theologians generally that might drop in, whether now or on YouTube. But um, what I find is this perspective, this very Latin perspective, is actually what underpins um, Lutheranism and even um, sort of more uh, sort of radical uh, Western derivations of Christianity. When I was uh, studying theology at uh, McGill back in the 1990s, there was a famous uh, professor, who's famous in Canadian context, a uh, reformed professor named Douglas Hall there. And you know, it was wonderful to be studying at McGill at a time when some of these figures were still alive. But I mention Hall in particular because his his magnum opus, his great work, was the theology of the cross. And if I remember correctly, it was in three hefty volumes. But he ran a seminar in which his first words were, all theology begins and ends at the cross. And as soon as I heard that, I thought, nope. Now, <laughs> that might sound incredibly arrogant for somebody who was at that time just a, uh, a young um, post-grad or second undergrad stroke post-grad student um, when it was the great Professor Hall saying so, but it couldn't compute with what I understood of the nature of theology. Theology begins, you might say, with creation. It begins in the relationship between created and creator. And if you imagine it like uh, an unfolding or a, a sort of, a, yeah, an unfolding uh, circle, um, it ends with the repatriation of creation or the meeting again of creation and creator. That's why I call it a loop instead of, for example, a horizontal line. At the middle or in the middle of that picture, you would find the cross. Let there be no doubt. But all theology does not begin and end at the cross. It passes through the cross. So from an orthodox point of view, I think we say the cross is central. It is not the begin all end all, if that makes sense. And so automatically, of course, um, you mentioned the fact that uh, you'd prayed an acathist um, um, uh, in which uh, the crucifixion was uh, referred to uh, in ways similar to what you uh, knew from a Roman Catholic setting. Of course, we have our um, prayers and our words that pay due love and respect to the crucifixion. Goodness knows that, in fact, we have three occasions on which in the Christian year, not just um, two, such as you find in the Latin tradition, but three occasions on which we celebrate and venerate the Holy Cross. 
Um, there's the elevation of the Holy Cross in September. We also have a Sunday of the Holy Cross in Lent. And then, of course, we have the veneration of the uh, cross uh, in Holy Week. So in that respect, we understand at the deepest level the centrality of the cross. And I would go further and say, um, although I cite this quite often, I think it was Gregory of Nyssa, I just don't want to get it wrong, who said that while the marriage between humanity and divinity takes place on the cross, in other words, while God and man are, you could say, married um, as in the manger at Bethlehem, that's what I'm trying to say, while God and man, the marriage between divinity and flesh or divinity and humanity between God and man is affected in the manger at Bethlehem. It is on the cross that the marriage is consummated. In other words, the irrevocable union is affected when the nails go through the flesh of our Lord. And um, that means the cross is inextricable from the picture of the incarnation do we um emphasize it the same way they do in the west no because it is a means to an end the incarnation itself at which the cross is uh, at the center for which the cross is at the center is the story the story isn't the cross any more than it is the beginning and end of all theology, according to Professor Hall in the early 1990s. So I hope that actually answers um, your question. I've got um, another question prior to the schism in 1054. Did the Orthodox re Church refer to itself as the Catholic Church? Um, yes, and it still does. Remember that Prior to any splits in the church, it was just the church. It was the ecclesia, the gathering of people who followed Jesus in the way. There were no such thing, of course, as denominations or, um, or uh, you know, orthodox, heterodox, or heretic. There was just those who followed Christ rightly in the way and that was called the ecclesia the gathering the church um in the fifth century when you get the um the uh splitting off of those whom today we call the oriental orthodox that is the churches that very early on took exception to the way the church was defining the person and work of Christ, then you you really have to refer to, strictly speaking, to churches, i.e. the Oriental Orthodox, those who um, did not accept the council of the church, those particular councils of the churches, and then the Orthodox Catholic Church, i.e. the church that remained. It's only um, gradually that the split between East and West becomes a full-scale rupture. And at no point prior to 1054 is it anything other than the Church. After 1054, and sometimes that date is overemphasized, we're using it as a symbolic date because of the mutual excommunications that took place between Constantinople and Rome. But remember, it is a date of convenience. After 1054, then we can talk about the Catholic West or the self-described Catholic West and the Orthodox East. If we were to be um, sort of theological rigorists, we could say that actually, no, the Catholic Orthodox Church exists in the East and there is... Um, a, heterodo a heterodox body in the West that calls itself the Catholic Church. Now, 
I'm not saying that to be polemical. I'm just saying it that if you want it to be really strict with your definition of terms and your use of terms, that's the way you might refer to, you know, these different, um, the, these developments in the church. But the word Catholic simply, which which means of the whole, um, is is one that's used by more than just the Roman Catholic Church. And Orthodox, likewise, Orthodox, which means right worship or right belief is a word that other churches um, deploy for themselves as well okay um as a matter of interest uh pope is just from the word uh papa it just means father and it means exactly the same thing as patriarch essentially uh but um the uh, word pope comes to be ascribed to two of the great patriarchs in particular, the patriarch of the West, that is the patriarch of Rome, who becomes known as the pope, and also the patriarch of Alexandria. And um, we call the, uh, the Coptic patriarch of Alexandria today, I believe it's Tawadros, um, but he is referred to as Pope as well. So really, it's 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 just a, uh, you might say, an affectionate form of father. Okay, given that Ephesus was mentioned, can I ask a question about iconography? Yes. I understand that some icons are miraculous and that they appear to be not created by human hands. However, most icons are human-made but have worked miracles. Why should ordinary people own icons? Do icons merely remind believers to venerate a saint, holy event, or facet of our Lord, or is there another purpose? Can any icons impart some kind of power, since I've heard of Orthodox priests claiming in some cases even paper icons have worked miracles? Um, yes, there will be a later um, discussion in which we explore icons more fully, but I will say now that um, my answer then which can be longer, um, can be um, linked to what I said about the Seventh Ecumenical Council. Remember, I said the Seventh Ecumenical Council, which condemned iconoclasm and upheld icons as being of the faith, um, they did so on the grounds that because God took on matter, and made it his own. In other words, because God took on flesh and made it his own, he took on the stuff of our substance, that is, matter. And um, by doing so, and by taking it back with him into heaven, where he returned uh, in you know full body and soul, um, made very clear that matter was part of the divine economy meaning it had been sanctified and even more perhaps than sanctified. That said, it means that matter can convey just as, um, just as it conveyed uh, our humanity to God, it can convey God's divinity um, to us. So matter can become priestly. And how much more can matter that's been designated specifically to a task do so? I'm hardly following what I myself am saying, but I hope what I've just said is clear. Take icons. Icons are images committed to surfaces. Those surfaces are normally wood, but could be through mosaic. Um, on plaster wall doesn't matter it's an it's a dance between forms of matter that ultimately seek to depict that which is holy that means even if i run off an icon for parish use which sometimes i have to because we don't simply have a whole catalog of icons i will run one off on my printer and frame it it's not ideal i know that but it at least allows us to have the image of the saint who we are commemorating on a given day with us in the context of liturgy. Do I have miraculous expectations of that 
um, copy of a copy of an icon? I don't. Does that mean that it couldn't possibly convey the holy purpose that I intended or hope it to convey? No. In other words, I think that um, whether we're talking about icons or any form of matter whose purpose it is to convey the holy, it is entirely up to the holy to instill it with the power. In other words, um, the spirit lists where he wills, and um, any such thing, according to our holy desire, can be rendered a holy item. I hope that answers your question, but I will go on, uh, I will uh, attack the answer at greater length when we talk about icons specifically. Okay, another question from week one on creation. It was said on week one, we dance with scripture. It was mentioned, let us create man in our image and likeness. The plural was explained in one of many possible interpretations. Can it be considered that the us in plural is including an invitation for man in his own act of creation through his act of refinement, emulation in form and deeds, achieving likeness entrusted to man's mission of supernal form and active participation? So the us plural is actually including me, or am I dancing with scripture in radical interpretation? No, you're not. Uh, you're certainly not being too radical. The fact is, our invitation, because in the very passage to which you refer, um, we are it is expressed that you know we are created in the image and likeness of God. That involves absolutely the opportunity, the invitation, and opportunity to um, cooperate with God in the act of creation. And so um, the artist is a co-operator with God. I'm deliberately pausing to, to make the distinction when we say cooperation clear. So too, really, is any worker, anybody who deploys their gifts um, in the service of God, or in some way that adds to beauty, goodness, truth in the world, so too are they acting as co-operators. And consequently, yes, absolutely, they enter into that dance with us. And um, I'm no expert on Rublev's Trinity, but I do know or have been told that as you gaze upon that breathtaking icon and uh, notice the posture of the three men often referred to as angels around the table it is deliberately left open in order that the viewer might um, enter into the discourse and i think that uh, whether that's a correct interpretation or not of the icon or one uh, and a, a legitimate way of engaging with the icon or not i don't know but what i can say is that um, if it isn't absolutely correct, it's at least a fortuitous um, um, mistake I'm making because uh, it seems to depict in visual form what you yourself are asking about in that question. So I think it's a great question. And no, I don't think that's too radical an interpretation. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, I think with that, we've come to 20 past eight. And although I've never done this before, um, and it may be because I mistimed my, uh, my uh, long discourse on the history of Christology, what I'm going to do now is just give you a final summary word so that when we return to talk about the, the implications of Christology next uh, session, we'll be able to... Um, pick up where we left off with some clarity and hopefully I'll give you a sense for um, how we might make the most of, of this session. We began by saying everybody has a Christology. We can see that through all sorts of images 
images that are both religious in intention, images that are specifically sacramental in nature, i.e. like an icon, but equally, even in pop culture, we can see that um, those who have heard of Christ, whether they're explicitly Christian or not, often express a sense for who Christ is and what he does. Now, the church was in a similar position from the beginning. Not that the church ever taught a different Christ, but that the church's um, full ability to articulate what it is it believed about Christ took time. It wasn't really until the last ecumenical council in 787 that we could say the church had fully worked out not only a definition of who Christ was and what he did, but also starting to make um, headway with the implications of who he was and what he did. Now, um, I gave you a great deal of historical detail in terms of looking at the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Constantinople, of Ephesus, of Chalcedon. Suffice it to say that if you want to compress that into a single sentence, it is um, it, it can all be summed up in the Chalcedonian definition that Christ was fully God and fully man. That presents all sorts of theological and philosophical challenges in terms of us getting our heads around it, but it is what it is, and that is the beating heart of the Orthodox understanding of the God-man. Thank you.